Hello everyone, welcome to the session about Tailrack Through the Ages until Kotlin, which will cover the periods from 1950 to 2016. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, João Esperancinha. I am a Java developer, but also a Kotlin developer, also a Groovy developer, and also a Scala developer. I've been mostly a developer in the Java virtual machine world, and I have been doing software for about 10 plus years. And I am an owner of this channel for about one year already. And I am a Kong champion, a Java professional and a Spring professional. These are my credentials. And this is, of course, me. But let's talk about the presentation today. It's about what is tail recursivity and the developments thereafter. So tail recursivity is about recursivity, of course, but is it about any recursivity? Well, no, not just any recursivity. It's about tail recursivity. And what is that? What is tail recursivity? Well, tail recursivity is all about the last function called. But what defines a tail recursive function? So a recursive function is said to be tail recursive when the last function call is the call to the recursive function. This means that when we call a function and we do it recursively, many times we can have different calls, maybe two, three, or four or more calls to the same recursive function. In this case, there's just one. The last function call doesn't occur in combination with any calculated value or any other function call. So this means that we only have one and there is nothing else as a multiplicative factor or an addition or subtraction or anything like that. It's just one call to the same recursive function. In other words, nothing should be stored per stack frame, which is awesome because we don't need to store values in each of the stack frames. But when did tail rack become a thing? Tail rack became a thing in the late 50s when computing studies were developed and showed that tail recursive algorithms could be easily re-implemented with, with their iterative counterpart. So no more usage of stack frames, well, at least not to store variables, and we wouldn't need to hold values in memory for every iteration. Plus, the space complexity would be reduced to 01. That means that the space that we need to store in memory would never change. Because of this, tail recursivity became a thing. And for that, let's have a look at the time period between the end of the 1950s up until 2016. We start out in the 1950s. More specifically, we start in 1957, where IBM Mathematical Formula Translating System was created by John Bacchus, a computer scientist, and his team, a language that would be otherwise known as Fortran. And Fortran was very advanced for its time, but it didn't contemplate any use of recursivity yet. It will be only later on that Fortran would include recursivity. And the reason for that is that all machines of that time had very few resources to be able to keep up with the use of recursivity. And so people were very wary of using anything related to recursivity in their machines. But of course, hardware develops and in 1958, John McCarthy was very busy trying to introduce recursivity in machines, and he was successful in that, and thereby creating Lisp. Lisp was a language that included recursivity, and because of that, John McCarthy was able to explore it further and understand one basic principle that would be the principle of TCO later on in the future, which is that tail recursive functions thus functions that don't use any variables in their stack frames, could be implemented in a different way using iterative implementations, therefore improving performance. But this was where Lisp stayed in the 1950s, because at that time other languages were being developed, like for example COBOL by Codasil. Codasil, a conference committee on data system languages, introduced this language specifically and to be very widely used in punch card computing. 
So these were punch cards that contained literal computer programs. In the 1960s, nothing too much happened in regards to recursivity, at least nothing too relevant. It was only in the 1970s that things changed. In 1975, Scheme was invented by Gerald J. Sussman and Guy Steele Jr. Scheme, a variation of Lisp, included a very important functionality, TCO, tail call optimization. This new feature allowed programmers to implement tail recursive functions with a certain behavior that would be changed after compilation, after running optimization algorithms, to generate assembly code that would have the same behavior or something a bit different, maybe something completely different than the original recursive function that they implemented, something like an iterative process, but not specifically an iterative process. And this allowed for codes to be more readable and maintain performance. Following suit, there were other languages like the standard meta language, which appeared between 1983 and 1984, along with other meta languages. The standard meta language was invented by Robert Milner, Matt Stofte, and others at the University at Edinburgh. After that, Erlang came along, invented by Joe Armstrong, Robert Verding, and Mike Williams at Ericsson in 1986. And finally, following the same principle in 1990, Haskell, named after Haskell Curry, and invented by a committee of researchers and academics. One thing that standard meta language Erlang and Haskell have in common is the idea that immutability is something better for developers. Immutability allows for developers to predict the behavior of the code that they are implemented during runtime because if fields and properties are marked to be immutable, then we know that they do not change. So we know if they start at point A and reach point B, they will hold the same values regardless of the functions that are applied to them or by them or for them. So these three languages upheld those principles, immutability, functional programming, and tail call optimizations. It also must be said that not all versions of standard meta language Erlang or Haskell uh, do tail call optimization. But the ones that do, they do this automatically. So this means that we don't need to specify in our code that we need optimization to occur. One very likely uh, explanation for having it automatically done in these languages is because the optimization algorithms for a lot of these tail recursive functions were pretty much predictable. So the idea that a tail call optimization wouldn't optimize a recursive function, a tail recursive function specifically, uh, wasn't even in their sights. So let's move on to the 1990s, where the Java Virtual Machine Revolution began. The Java Virtual Machine was created to solve a very specific problem. Up until this point, developers were used to creating programs to work on different physical machines. However, a program that would be made to work on machine A would not necessarily work for machine B. And this created a dilemma. How do we create a program that works for all different kinds of machines? Regardless of the way the peripherals work, the way the memory management works, or any other feature that would be specific to any kind of hardware. The answer to this was created by Sun Microsystems in the form of a virtual machine that would be known as Java Virtual Machine. The Java Virtual Machine would be used to establish a bridge between the native code and another kind of code that would only run inside of the Java Virtual Machine known as bytecode. And to create bytecode, we would need a compiler and the compiler would have to interpret a language that would be attractive to developers. 
and that language was released in 1995 and became known as Java. And Java was released by Sun Microsystems and the inventor of this language is usually known as James Goslin and his colleagues Mike Sheridan and Patrick Norton. However, Java was based on object-oriented programming principles that were quite revolutionary during that time. It was also a high-level language and, for the most part, it was also a language that would allow to implement immutable uh, properties. But this didn't come as a default feature of Java. A lot of the default features of Java would still rely on mutable principles, the idea that a variable can change during the lifetime of the application and during the runtime of the application. And these variables and fields would not necessarily respect the rules established by other languages that were finding out the benefits of using immutability and using functional programming. So Java was very distant in that aspect. And this frustrated some developers of that area because although they appreciated the developments of the Java virtual machine, the Java language itself was not something that they were really enjoying that much. And so at some point, they started developing other kind of languages. Other languages started being developed, tried, and submitted to the test of usage. And the idea was to create alternatives to Java that would still compile into bytecode, and that bytecode would still be able to run on the Java virtual machine. But it would be years before a new language would be created and would be, find a place in the market. The first language that did this in a successful way was Scala, and Scala was released in 2003 and it was created by Martin Odersky. Scala was a language, is a language, that is based on functional programming principles, also object-oriented programming principles, and it is also a language highly based on immutability. And the great thing about it is precisely that, that we can really have programs created in a functional programming way, which means we can reuse functions, use functions as objects, we can create all kinds of things and features that are specific to functional programming. So Scala was a great step, but it wasn't really well adopted. And the reason for that is that it was not really readable for many developers that were used to languages that would be very easy to read. Scala was, however, massively adopted by data science projects and streaming projects. It was easy to couple with things like Apache Spark and Kafka and also RevitMQ. But however, the adoption wasn't as successful as expected, and Scala was not the only language that tried and didn't find Exact the, uh, the, exactly the success that it was looking for. And another language that came to the market in 2007 was something different, and it was another language that wanted to try the, the Java virtual machine, but in a different way. It relied on principles established by Lisp, Scheme, and other languages that followed that kind of pattern using a lot of parentheses, and still using a lot of immutability and using, using functional programming and, and keeping that kind of feel that those languages left to us, but be able also to have that code compiled into bytecode. And that language was Clojure in 2007 by Rich Hickey. This language unfortunately found even less success than Scala and the reason for that was in great part that people were getting used to high-level languages. And there is something about Clojure, the way it works, in a similar fashion as Lisp and as uh, Scheme and also other languages, that isn't very appealing for the average developer. So it became a bit of a niche market for specific people that really enjoyed that language and wanted to try something completely different than the other high-level languages. Um, 
Another language that I'm not mentioning here is Groovy. Groovy was another kind of script language that can also run inside the Java Virtual Machine, which is also used by things like testing uh, frameworks like uh, uh, Spock. Um, <clears throat> but that language is not here mentioned because, of course, we must not forget that we are talking about recursivity and tail recursivity. And so uh, that's why uh, uh, Groovy is not mentioned here. However, in 2010, another project was begun. And that project was started within the IntelliJ team, within the uh, IntelliJ team, within the JetBrains team. And that team started developing something radically new and also very similar to Java and also very much implementing functional programming and immutability and a lot of new features that were unique to that language but also an adoption of features of all the other languages. It created a, 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 a compilation of all the best features of all languages up until this time. That language has massive success today and it hit a chord between developers that like high-level languages and want to use features that other languages had that Java didn't provide it. And that new language was created and released in 2016 by the team led by Andre Braslav. And this new language was called Kotlin. And Kotlin seems to have found a market, a well-established market, and it continues to grow to this day. So what was the point of this segment? In this segment, I wanted to show you the evolution of languages from the end of the 1950s up until 2016, where the first release of Kotlin has taken place. The idea is to show the evolution of recursivity through these years and how and when the first idea that tail recursivity could potentially offer possibilities inside programming languages and when tail call optimization happened for the first time in 1975 and in which language, in this case Scheme, that happened. But what was the point of tail and what is the point of tail call optimization? The idea is to provide a way to simplify our functions. We know that recursivity can make functions difficult to read and to understand. It also allows us to establish recursivity and implement recursive algorithms without impacting performance, and of course only for tail recursive algorithms. It makes code easy to read. This one we will see later on that it's not always the case and there's always a gray area in how easy a code is to read. It avoids the usage of global variables. Maybe up until the, the, the 90s and beginning of 2000s, the usage of global variables was not so seen as in a negative way. Uh, it was always seen, let me put it dif differently, it's, it has always been seen in a negative way, only that in some algorithms, for example, when we're do doing a for loop or a while loop or a do while loop, we sometimes tended to use uh, a, a variable outside that scope to add or to accumulate values. Um, so those variables are something that we can avoid if we use uh, tail recursive uh, 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 implementations and there we apply tail call optimizations. And another thing is that because we don't have to use temporary variables or mutable variables, we can adhere to immutability principles. But this was much later on. In the 1950s, uh, the only thing that came to light was recursivity. So let's have a look at our example that we're going to use throughout this presentation. And it's going to be the basis on to be able to see how this same algorithm could have been implemented in all the different languages. Of course, today I have access to the most modern uh, versions of these languages. And so there could be differences from the original languages where this was originally implemented 
to the code versions that I have actually created for this presentation. And so let's have a look at our pseudocode example and then the different versions of this code in the different languages. So the example we are going to have a look at is the Fibonacci sequence. It's a very simple example. And this example is very easy to follow and it's known and we can work with it to understand the different steps in the different languages. The Fibonacci sequence we are going to use is one that starts with index zero and starts with value zero at index zero. It is the original Fibonacci sequence presented by Leonardo of Pizza in 1202. And we can represent it this way. And we can see here that it starts with zero and then it goes to one, one, this whole thing is three, then the here is five, and then we see that it goes up to eight, 13, 21, and so forth. And this is a statue of Fibonacci, which was created in 1863 by Giovanni Paganucci. Just a curiosity, not really important for the, for the presentation. And this is one of the first uh, ways to implement code using an iterative solution. So we can see that we have a function, Fibonacci, that where we receive the n, which is the index, and then finally we go into the actual implementation where we see that the first result is zero, the next value is one, and with these two values we can extrapolate all the other values of the Fibonacci sequence. So this means that we can enter a loop where the first index uh, that we're going to generate start with zero up until n. And so inside that loop, we create a temporary variable with the next value, and we calculate the next value as a sum of the result we have and the next value. So we can see already that if we do this in the first iteration, we get one plus zero, that's one. Then the, the, the result stays as zero, but it will be assigned a new value, which is the next value, which is one and then the index goes up. If we do it once more, then we see that the next is still one, and one enters the value of temp, but then the next goes as a result of one plus, which is one, then, then, then the next goes as a, as a result plus one, which is two, and of course, plus one, which is two, and then the, uh, the, the actual result is temp, which we have assigned before to be one. So the next result is two, and that's why in the next loop, we return two to, we assign two to temp, and then the, the result of, and, and then we just keep going in the sequence. Next then is the, res, is the result which we had as one. The next result is two. So the, that means that the next is three and the result is still one. So we keep going in, in, uh, in this while until we get our result and then we, we return it. This code has uh, the advantage, which means that it uh, it has an O-N complexity in time because for every single while we need to make one iteration so that adds to the time but the space complexity is O-1 because our results are kept on the same variable which occupies the same space and therefore because result is kind of an accumulative result it doesn't occupy more space than it has already been assigned and allocated to. It is very efficient code. It is not very pleasant to the eye. And some people would argue that it's difficult to read. And perhaps you have noticed that I had a bit of a trouble explaining how this algorithm works. So now let's have a look at a different implementation of this algorithm, in this case, in a non-iterative way. And this will be a recursive way. And this will be one of the earliest styles of creating recursivity in functions. Let's have a look at it. This will be an implementation of recursivity for the Fibonacci sequence. And this is the function. In this case, we are calling the function Fibonacci in exactly the same way as before with n as the index of the value we want to calculate in the sequence of Fibonacci. 
And then we make two calls, one for Fibonacci n minus one, and the other one for Fibonacci n minus two. As we make these calls recursively, we can see immediately that the for every call, there are going to be two calls created in the worst case. And in the best case scenario, there's just going to be one call. But for all the other cases other than the last one, there will be two calls being generated. So it will grow something like this. We make the first call to n minus one, for example, then we make another call to, uh, well, in this case, for example, n minus three, and then n minus two, and then finally the result, which then allows us to make the calculation on this side, well, in this case, this side here, and then we can get the result, and then we can finally calculate this side of the uh, equation, and then keep accumulating results this way until we finally reach the end of our Fibonacci sequence calculation. The problem with this implementation is that, of course, the time increases um, exponentially uh, by a factor of two. So two to the power of n calls that we need to make. And the same case happens to space time complex to, to the to the sorry to the space complexity, which grows also to by a factor of two for each one of these calls. All of these stack frames accumulate the result of the Fibonacci sequence. Which makes this algorithm not very efficient, but it makes it a whole lot easier to read. I mean, this representation is much easier to read than the previous one. But this was, of course, not the end of recursivity. And because this algorithm was mainly not very efficient, actually the whole focus of criticizing this algorithm is that it was just not efficient, um, another solution needed to, to be done. And for that, now let's have a look at a tail recursive example. The tail recursive example, as a recap, should be an example where we can call the same function that we initially called as a last function statement of the call, which is a bit complicated to explain, but let's have a look at the actual pseudocode to understand it a bit better. In this Fibonacci function, we still call Fibonacci with the same input argument with n, the difference is that now we are making use of FIBO helper, which is a helper function that allows us to make different recursive calls using the result parameter as an accumulator of results for the Fibonacci sequence. And next, as the next result of the Fibonacci sequence. Let's have a look at one simple example with index uh, 2. If we call this function with two, what will happen is that the first call will be FIBO helper 201, and that will call this one, two minus one plus next plus result plus next. So that will be two minus one will be one, next will be one, and result plus next will be zero plus one, which is one. So this will, will be FIBO helper one, one, one. When we receive the value, the, the, the arguments here, then we see that n is not yet zero. And so we make a nil, one last call, which is one minus one, zero, plus, and, and then here we, we know that next is one and result plus next is two. So when we get to here, our result is one, our next is two, and n is zero, so we end up the, the we end the calculation result uh, with a result of one, which is what we have here. If we continue, or if we start at the very beginning, we'll, we now know that we got one, right? So let's see what would have happened in the next result if we had started with the index three. So we receive here three. So this will be two, this will be zero, and this will be uh, this would be zero plus one. So two one one. Two one one. So that means that the second call would be one. Uh, 
uh, would be one, uh, one. It would be one, one, and two. So then the next call would be zero, two, zero, two, and then the result the result which would be one so two plus one three so next would be three but we return the result which is two which gives us two as a result tail recursivity is as you can see is also yet not that easy to explain but we know that this is the behavior it keeps calling itself several times without accumulating values in the stacked frames and therefore this can be optimized and when it is optimized it means that when we get the result the actual time and space complexity become the same as can become the same as the uh, time and space complexity of the iterative algorithm so in this case the space is shared in every successive calls and because there's no actual space being accumulated then the space doesn't changes so that remains the same and the time is itself because we are just calling one function this improves a lot the recursive algorithm it gets back to being very efficient it's still easy to read but not too much and the problem with this is that the efficiency isn't 100 percent guaranteed but there is another problem with this we are still making a recursive function and wouldn't it be great if we could just transform these recursive functions into an iterative function without even knowing it without even seeing it just let the compiler do that for us so that we don't have to do that and that is what tail call optimization does and in this example i'm just extrapolating what many compilers would do in this situation but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will do this and i'm not pointing out to any specific compiler that would do this it's simply the idea is that we program like this this is how we implement our code and then the compiler after optimizations would turn our function into something like this in the assembly code and I'm not saying that this is a simply go is a, is a assembly code. What I'm saying is that if we decompile the resulting de uh, assembly code into the language that we are using, we will see a different implementation than the ones than the one we originally originally created. If that compiler uh, has a comprehensive uh, tail call optimization algorithm implemented in it. And it depends if we want to implicitly make a tail call optimization or if we just want to uh, um, to, to uh, uh, decide if we want to make that tail call optimization. So this is the very basic principle behind tail call optimization, tail recursivity, recursivity and iteration. And now it's time to have a look at the languages. And the first languages that we are going to have a look is Fortran. So we are now back in the late 50s, just before Lisp arrived into the scene. The Fortran code that I was able to gather and to try out has this format. And this is typical of the 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 uh, the uh, uh, typical of late fifties, and we can see here that this one is an implementation of a Fibonacci sequence using an iterative way, and this one is a recursive implementation of the Fibonacci. However this implementation would only be possible in 1995 and so we can run this program but we are not in 19 in the late 50s we're not simulating the late 50s and fortran nowadays is 
kind of implemented in a different way. And so we see that everything is uh, uh, lowercase and we have a different syntax. I, and just as a fair warning, I'm not an expert in any of these languages that I'm going to present, and, uh, except for the last ones that we're going to, to, to have a look at. Uh, but for these ones, I know what I know and I know what I found out to make this presentation. So bear with me. Let's now have a look at the actual uh, way to run this using IntelliJ and a few common line. So let's go to IntelliJ. Okay, so now that we are in IntelliJ, I can uh, open uh, the different projects and the projects that we need for this uh, presentation are all located in the root of the Austin Sider Right Roth uh, repository. And we are now having a look at uh, Fortran. So if we open the Fortran folder, there are a lot of, there's a lot of code that I've uh, added there. And we can run this code this way. If we want to run Fortran code, a good way to do that is to install gFortran. Of course, these are only examples available to use to be, they are readily available to use in Linux machines. If you don't have a Linux machine, please leave in the comments the, the, the operating system that you are uh, using this. And especially if you are having troubles using it, because I can also uh, add here scripts to use this in Windows or using in a Mac OS environment. So please do put comments on there if you are having trouble uh, running these examples. But anyways, let's check the uh, first the make file. Uh, in all of these projects, I have a make file where you can simply just uh, uh, run this code if these comments work in your machine, of course. Um, but one of the things that I have in all of these projects is this shared script install all where you can um, where you can uh, uh, install automatically, theoretically, uh, these compilers in your machine. Uh, these have been tested, of course, in Linux machines. And I cannot guarantee that this will work in another environment, especially Mac OS, because of course it would it won't work anyways because I'm using sudo apt. Um, so that would probably not work on the Mac OS. Maybe you have to brew, use brew or something like that. Again, let me know. Anyways, this is already installed. All of these compilers are already installed in my machine. So let's get into it. Let's open the Fibonacci fol folder in the command line. And here, uh, let's have a look at, for example, the. We can look at, for example, the normal iterative function. So this is the normal iterative function for the the modern version of Fortran. But we also have the fifties version of uh, Fortran, and we might be interested in running this. So how do we run this? We can just go here to. Um, for example, we can copy it from here. We can run this comment here. And this will compile our Fortran pro program. And we can then run it like this. And we have the, this is all, this is all hard coded by the way. And of course here we can just uh, calculate the Fibonacci of 100, which is this result, 3.54 to, Three point fifty four times ten to the power of twenty. So that's a lot. Um, but this is the result that we are looking for in all of the tests that we are going to do. So this is the iterative uh, version. We can also use the recursive function. But let me repeat: this is a fifties styled Fibonacci implementation using Fortran. And this would not work in a 50s version of Fortran because the recursive uh, uh, keyword does not exist there. This is why I've put it also in the slides that I put a, for a forbidden sign on it just to remind us that this is just a style code and it's not really the 50s version. If we run the recursive Fibonacci,
like this one and then run it recursively oh sorry. that's not expected one of the things that we immediately see is that it's kind of taking up resources of our machine and the reason for that is that it is a recursive call and there is no tail call optimization in this case and the reason why there is no tail call optimization has to do with these two calls fortran doesn't have the ability to make a tail call optimization if we are calling this two times and because this breaks the the rule of tail call recursivity because uh, the last call that we are making of this recursive algorithm is actually two calls so it will never work however if we use modern Fortran and we use the recursive keyword and we apply that to a Fibonacci helper styled implementation where this Fibonacci helper is a tail recursive function then we will see that this will work without any problems so I have here the script for that if we implement if we run this so this will compile our Fibonacci and uh, it will also let me have a look. So that is compiled. This is the TCO version. And to be able to run it, Fibonacci <coughs> TCO recursive. Sorry. To be able to run it, we need then to run it like this. Yep. Apologies. Like this. And that will create uh, this uh, executable. And then we can just run it like this. And this is our executable. And in this case, we can see that we get the same result for 100. And the Fibonacci of 100 is this. And we can see that it's very efficient. It is still a recursive function, but in the background, uh, TCO has been applied and this is one example in Fortran of course but there are other examples that we can use and that are reminiscent, reminiscent of the time having said that it is important to mention that Lisp uh, is a language that up until the end of the 1950s didn't have uh, tail call optimization included in it it was only later on that that happened but we'll still have a look at the examples uh, so this is the code that I was able to come up with uh, with Lisp this code isn't necessarily the code that was used in the 1950s I would imagine that it would be kind of like this uh, this is the iterative form this is the recursive form of it so much less efficient and this is the tail recursive form of it uh, Lisp in current times does support tail call optimization and it doesn't mean necessarily that it will do a conversion of our code in the background to something iterative it only means that it will apply its own algorithm of tail call optimization whether it is an iterative iterative form that we get in the assembly code or something else that is not up to us to decide as developers that uh, that is up to lisp to decide Lisp has been around since the 1950s, since 1958, and I could only find references to Lisp still in use up until 1984 uh, in the current version that we are using, which is Common Lisp. So let's have a look at it. In the example I have created, which is located in the Lisp projects, I include a script that you can use to install the SPCL console. This is where we can issue uh, Lisp commands. And I'm also including this RL wrap 
command where, where we can start the SPCL console quickly and we can also uh, install already QuickLisp which is a way to issue uh, Lisp instructions um, in an easier way. Um, the example is located here in Tail Recursion. It also includes examples using factorials, but we are just going to use the Fibonacci sequence. So in the make file, I include different scripts. One script that is called run demo fast and the other run demo slow. And these scripts are available in all other projects. And the idea is to be able to run projects in where the algorithm is efficient enough to run fast and uh, to be able to run algorithms where we are actually not going to see any result because the Fibonacci that are going that we are trying to calculate in all of these projects is a Fibonacci of 100 with which if implemented in an iterative in a sorry a recursive way will require will consume a lot of resources from the computer and that's exactly the idea to show that a non-optimized algorithm will have a tendency to crash your machine um, so let's get started with the examples um, another thing that I but before we do that I want to show another um, uh, another thing which is how to start the console we can start it with rl rep sbcl for example and then we are in the console to leave it we can use quit and we issue commands like the ones that i see that we see here in the um, in the readme file and they're all you, you we have to issue them between these accolades so between these parentheses and the instructions to make these installations are all here in the readme file. Again, questions you may have about the installation of Lisp and the console, please let me know in the comment section of this video. But let's get started with running the, the, the program. And first, let's have a look at how the program is structured. So in the main Lisp file, there's we can find all the Lisp code and I have uh, set up some comments for it just for us to get a better idea of what the functions do um, in this case uh, this is the iterative uh, function as we can see it loops through the uh, through the different indexes of the of the uh, of the algorithm in this case this is for the factorial this is the implementation for the Fibonacci tail recursive function. Again, we have an help, uh, a helper function that will continuously call itself. And this is the tail recursive function where we are uh, calling it recursively using three arguments. And this function defines three parameters, A, B, and count, where A is the result that we uh, A is the result of our computation for the Fibonacci sequence. In the iterative form, it's again a loop that will return the result B after running through all of the indexes of the Fibonacci sequence. And finally, the just simply the recursive, the very, very unperformant uh, uh, Fibonacci recursive uh, implementation. To run this, we need to issue all of these commands and to run this via the command line we can run SPCL with this uh, with this switch and then with these different evaluations it will execute every single one of these commands one by one and just to give a quick introduction the ASDF is needed to be able to load the project then we need to set up the our uh, quick lisp quick lisp once installed needs to be reloaded this way and after it has been reloaded we can then uh, we can then load our project and that is with uh, this command and then we can try and load the system uh, the, the the compiled files and the test files using these two commands finally these this is a way to um, to uh, execute one command and if you want to list its output we can use format and then use this uh, this uh, 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 command 
that is very similar to the way we do this so we just need to first specify our package and then the name of the function that we want to execute and what we are going to do with run demo fast is we're going to run the two algorithms for the factorial this is something that I've embedded into the uh, script uh, as, as a demo and the and we're going to run the two last Fibonacci uh, implementations the tail recursive and the iterative and this should run with no problem so make run demo fast and there is no problem so it ran really fast and it calculated the Fibonacci sequ sequence as expected the result for the index 100 however if we run the the recursive function so make run demo slow it will hang in there and even though this computer is quite capable it hangs in there and it doesn't go anywhere so but the question is did tail call optimization occurred as we will see in also in other languages tail call optimization doesn't have to occur when we say that we want it to occur and in things like lisp when we make just the fact that we make a tail recursive function means already that the uh, compiler will try and figure out if this uh, function can be uh, can be can still be optimized in this case I I could decompile the code to figure out if uh, if uh, if that would work but we just need to to understand at this point what I, the message that I want to bring in in this in this case is that tail call optimization is also in Lisp out of our control it is something that will happen and uh, and it's a way to try to guarantee as much as possible that our code gets optimized as much as possible now this is Lisp and now let's move on to another language and this time is COBOL. COBOL is a language today that it's not very much that it's not quite used, and it's uh, it's a language that uh, not many people want to work in it. I personally also don't want to have anything to do with it, but the language exists already for a long time, and it, it exists of course since 1959, as I mentioned before, and the language has a lot of similarities with Fortran, and the syntax is also quite similar to turn this bit of the code into this bit of the code was a bit of a challenge for me because the uh, COBOL is not really originally intended to run recursive calls so therefore to make a recursive call in COBOL can be a challenge these these days but um, but the idea is that from from the 1950s onwards there was a point where COBOL really allowed recursive recursivity and recursivity happened around 1985 and that's when we can make programs like this so let's have a look at COBOL in action so COBOL is a different language that we should be able to run easily and I have it here I have all my my COBOL projects in this folder uh, COBOL projects are usually saved in COB files and if we go to the make file I have included a script to install GNU COBOL this is one version of the compiler uh, I'm not entirely sure if this compiler contains tail call optimization but what it does allow is to make recursive calls so if we look at this iterative implementation you can see it's very cryptic and uh, COBOL has these things with uh, with uh, numbers where this is actually how we define types in COBOL and one of the things that I find interesting about COBOL and that was that caught my attention in such a unique language is that we can specify how many numbers we want for units and how many numbers we want for decimals when we declare a variable um, 
And this is something that uh, we don't see here in the iterative function, but if we look at the recursive implementations for the, uh, let's see. Yeah, um, I apologize. We were looking at the factorial iterative implementation. If we look at the Fibonacci iterative implementation, I include here these types. So these, this, mean that, this means that this type allows 21 decimals and allows, uh, sorry, uh, allows 21 units and one decimal. And this is important because the, fact, the Fibonacci of 100 is quite big. So let's look at the make file. In the make file, we see that we can call the COBOL compiler using COBC, COBOL compiler, and we can create our executables via this copc-x command and the all of the calls are fast calls uh let me have a look recursive calls here yeah so this uh in this example i only was able to implement the the recursive call which happens to be a tail recursive call so there's only one call to to Fibonacci. So the scripts that I have created only run fast examples. But the idea was just to show the form that COBOL have, has and the way it, it was created back then. So if we go to our COBOL folder and then we run, run demo like this, then we find that it calculates all the different uh, then it calculates the Fibonacci of 100 uh, with the two different um, implementation examples. In this case, there's no strictly rec recursive implementation, but that is not necessary for the example we are having a look at. The important thing to note here is how different this language actually is from the languages that we mostly use today. The most popular languages have really nothing to do with this and are very, very, very different. Okay, so this was COBOL. Let's have a look at another example. And the other example we are having a look at is Scheme. Scheme is a language that has been around since 1975. And one of the ways of implementing with Scheme is this one. This is an iterative form where we can just loop through the n index of the Fibonacci sequence and find our result that way. It can also be transformed to this, which is the recursive function, which you know already, it's not very performative. And then we this can evolve to the tail recursive implementation, which is this one, where we can call the same function over and over and over again until we get the final recursive result. Scheme introduced tail call optimization, which is a kind of optimization that doesn't necessarily mean that the tail recursive function will be converted back to an iterative form. What it does mean is that uh, some sort of algorithm will be applied to this implementation and turn this implementation into something different in the assembly generated code. So this means that it's not always certain that this kind of transformation occurs. Lisp has been around, sorry, Scheme has been around since 1975. Scheme is uh, one of the childs of uh, Lisp and as you can see it has almost the same form as Lisp. I found out uh, references about Scheme since 1975 up until 2013 uh, and I'm not entirely sure if Scheme uh, has more versions um, uh, in a later time than 2013 but what's important is that we can look at the examples now and I'm going to show you them running in my local machine. So if we go to our project and we go to the uh, scheme projects folder, we will find a different example. So we'll, we'll see factorial examples and Fibonacci examples. But important is to first configure, configure the compiler for scheme and I'm using GIL. And I'm using GIL 3.0 and the installation script is this one. Once that is installed, we can use GIL as a command a command line and that will compile our code to its 
uh, its binary version, and its binary binary version will be immediately executed. But let's just have a look first at the code that we are going to execute, and we're going to focus on the Fibonacci different implementations. So. Uh, So this is the Fibonacci iterative implementation, which we have seen in the slide. This is the recursive implementation, and this is the recursion with a tail call optimization, possibly. And But first, let's have a look at the iterative implementation. We can see here a do loop that will go from i to n, and we can see that it does exactly what we expect the Fibonacci algorithm to do, which is to sum the different values of the, the the Fibonacci sequence and then give out the, the result that we are looking for. Namely, the result here of this Fibonacci sequence is, is this one, x. So x is the actual result we are looking for and we are sending it uh, over and over through this loop. Yeah, In this file here, we have the recursive version of this implementation. As, as we can see, it, it calls two times the, the Fibonacci function. And finally, we have the recursive with the tail call optimization. So this is a tail recursive function which uses a helper function. Again, the same algorithm as we have seen multiple times before. And to run the file, we know already that if we run demo fast, uh, if we run this script, then we'll be able to run the optimized versions that will run very fast. And if we run the recursive version, this won't run very well in our local machines. So let's run the demo uh, fast script. And we find that it runs almost immediately with the two different results and with the tail recursive implementation and the iterative implementation. Important always never to forget that this is for certain a tail recursive function but it's not for certain that the tail call optimization has occurred for that we would have to investigate the assembly or or the binary code uh, which is something that for some languages is quite difficult to do uh, we are going to do that in uh, uh, two languages further in this presentation so uh, but first let's try and run the run demo slow and as you can see everything hangs in because it's making multiple recursive calls and it's in, in an exponential way so it is using a lot of resources um, so this one we want to stop and now this was the example for the scheme programming language so now let's have a look at another language this would be known as sml this is the standard meta language, which there are mer many variations of it. And the one we are looking at is the standard meta language, New Jersey. This uh, language came around 1983, 1984, but it actually began much, much earlier in 1970, which is something I didn't mention in the, uh, in the timeline that we've discussed before. However, having done that, let's now watch how the code works. The standard meta language is one of these languages that introduced the concept of immutability and how good it is for developers to think about immutable concepts. The idea is then that we, as we create a variable in the form of a field of just a local variable, it would not uh, uh, change its, its, uh, its value during the course of the runtime of the application or during its own lifetime. So this added a bit of predictability to the code and uh, and here we can see that we have only two implementations and that's the reason why i'm not putting the iterative implementation because that wouldn't make sense to do in standard method language and so on the left side we see the typical fibonacci implementation implementation calling it the uh, recursive function two times and making a sum out of it and on the right we see one improvement that would be a recursive function having a helper function for it that would receive the typical three arguments so the three parameters n a and b are used then to uh, create these successive calls and again 
the tail recursive function, the only problem that it has normally is just that it runs the risk of a stack overflow. That can be mitigated with the improvements made by TCO. But the standard method language exists already for a very long time. Of course, as I mentioned, 1970s, the, the, the beginnings were made, but the first release was actually Moby in the form of Moby and then SML New Jersey, ML Ton, and then all the way up to 2022. So now let's have a look at the language working in action. So in the project, I have the SML projects located in the root and these projects are sitting side by side to the make file. Again, the make file has all the scripts needed to run this, hopefully in a Linux machine. Any questions you may have, put down your comments below so that I can help you with installation in other operating systems. Um, so important is to first get the compiler. The compiler is available in the uh, standard Meta language New Jersey website. And I've downloaded this version. 111.99.4 and what the script does it it uh, decompacts the uh, the file and then runs the install script this will install the um, the sml compiler if you want you can add bin slash sml to your path it can be handy and and bin slash sml will simply open the console which is this one if you want to exit the console if you use control C, it's not going to do anything, but if you use control D, it will. Um, and then you you can leave the, the console. And just like Lisp, we can issue commands if we send them over to the, um, to the SML uh, uh, command line like this. We just echo the command we want to use, the sequence of commands we want to use, separated by semicolons, and then we send that to bin slash SML. So for example, if I want to uh, execute the factorial recursive function of five, then I just do this and I get the factorial of five, which is 120. But we are interested in the Fibonacci sequence. So let's have a look at the recursive implementation of the Fibonacci sequence. So this is it. And Again, to run this function, I can run the run demo uh, slow. Um, it, this will probably not work. And there's a reason, there are two reasons for that. One of the reasons is that uh, comes close to this uh, declaration up here, this structure int if, int if. This means that we uh, are allowed to make calculations with longer integers. And that means that the program will not explode. Uh, when we try to run it. Um, and if we look at this structure int inf int if, it kind of remind me of implicits, implicits in uh, Scala. And uh, you probably see that as well in this case, uh, but it's nice to observe that as a, a language that potentially uh, gave inspiration to, to, uh, to Scala to exist. Again, I'm not saying this that that it is what happened, but it could be, uh, it could have been part of the inspiration to create Scala. Anyways, uh, let's first run the slow example. So if we go to the make file and we see how this works, we are just going to call the recursive uh, function, and because it's just one instruction, why not just copy paste it, run it in the command line. And we'll see that it keeps on running and it probably will never end. It's just there. It's just stuck there and it will maybe finish uh, the calculations. And if you don't hear the sound of my computer, I can tell you that it's pretty much uh, being very busy running this, um, this function. So I will just stop it using control C and we can now have a look at the uh, TCO recursive algorithm. Now here we have essentially the same kind of implementation that we saw in the pseudocode and all the other languages up until this point. And one of the things that is uh, important to remember here as well is again, we have the structure inf inf so that we can make calculation with larger numbers. Um, 
So let's run this function. And what I'm going to do in, the, in this make file, in the run demo fast, is run the factorials, uh, the factorial functions and the Fibonacci functions. So if I make run demo fast, they run almost immediately. And if we check the result of the, um, the Fibonacci sequences, then we see that this is the result for 100. And the result for Fibonacci 5 is in, uh, in index 5, that would be 6. We could count like this, like 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, and then 5. So if we start on index 0, this would be 5. So here is 5, so it is correct. So um, the uh, Fibonacci sequence is correctly calculated and it has done the calculation very very quickly and this doesn't necessarily mean that tail call optimization has been applied here this is one of the maybe one of the issues with uh, tail call optimization it's because it's up to the compiler to decide if tail call optimization is going to happen in other languages as we will see later we can specify to the compiler that we want the um, tail call optimization to be performed if needed and so it is always unpredictable if it's going to happen and to really be sure if tail call optimization has happened we would have to look into the assembly code that's being generated and also for sml that takes a bit of uh, um, a bit of work and a lot of familiarity with assembly code so that is something that we will not do in this presentation but we can be sure that SML incorporated tail call optimization in different languages, in different uh, versions of the language. All right, so let's have a look at the next programming language. So now let's have a look at a language called Erlang. Erlang is used today in many different frameworks and for example, databases. And so it's a very versatile language and we are now just going to have a look at a few examples of how it works and see how this language differs in its approach to software development. Erlang was released in 1986 and in 1986 we can see these kind of transformations in the language where modules are adopted. And another thing is the idea of overloading functions and yet another thing is to call specific uh, functions when the arguments follow certain uh, uh, certain uh, matching matchers. So let's see the case on the left side. The Fibonacci recursive function, of course, in this case has exactly the same uh, performance as the others that we've seen so far. In this case, a really bad performance because it calls it two times, and we know already about the progression in time and space, how complex that can become. But we see here something different, which is the overloading of the Fib function. And that means that it's, it becomes easier to implement uh, certain functions and this can also increase potential performance in this case. But we'll see in practice that we still cannot perform the Fibonacci of 100 with a purely recursive function in this case. Then we have a tail recursive function in, on this side, which sounds a bit strange, but it's in, in it uses the same principle of using a helper function, which is called fib iter, and fib will be called with the index, just in the same way as so far. The difference here is that we have a matching function, a function that matches with arguments. So if the arguments are zero, any a, and whatever is on the, on the, on the last argument, it will always return a. And this means that this calculation <clears throat> um, becomes quicker because the, uh, the, the, we can reduce a bit of the processing. Now, Erlang exists since 1986, as I mentioned before, but that was just, <clears throat> but that was just a proprietary release. Um, Erlang became commercial in 1996, so it's very recent language still, and it uh, it went on to be developed up until 2021. After 2021, I couldn't find any more information about further releases. And so uh, 
this is a bit how Erlang uh, uh, evolved through the years. But now let's have a look at a real example of how Erlang works. So of course I have a folder called Erlang projects and in the Erlang projects I have all of these different functions. They are uh, in different files. I have one factorial, factorial recursive dot ERL -E that is the uh, extension of the Erlang uh, uh, source code files. And for the for the recursive function, I have here the Fibonacci recursive dot ERL, and I have the Fibonacci recursive TCO, which is a tail recursive function. But to install Erlang, we need to install Erlang via the command line like this in a Linux machine. Again, if you have issues with another machine, don't forget to write a comment about it. And and I've already installed this. And so if we want to run the the demo uh, fast, for example. Uh, we can just again do make run demo fast but one important thing to understand is how Erlang commands are issued so in this case I'm using C to compile the factorial recursive TCO uh, uh, file and then after doing that I have access to the function via the module and then I can access the function via factorial 5 the same thing goes to the Fibonacci recursive function, the Fibonacci uh, for 10 and the Fibonacci for 100 for the recursive TCO. And I have here for the run demo slow, the Fibonacci recursive Fib 100. So if we run the demo slow, we should expect that the, the this will hang. It looks like it is doing something but it, that it is expecting a command from us, but it's really not. It's just doing a calculation. And again, my computer is starting to take off. So I will stop it and I will just run the demo fast. And as I do that, I, we see that everything uh, runs on time. It runs very quickly and I go back to the command line. And again, all of these functions work correctly. The Fibonacci recursive of 10, of course, works locally and that results in 55. And the Fibonacci of 100 results in this huge number. And that huge number was able to be calculated because it's using namely tail, a tail recursive function. But we don't know, we still don't know if this is a tail call optimization. If this comes because of a tail call optimization or just purely that it is a tail recursive function. And again, in Erlang, the same case uh, applies. We need to investigate the code that has been generated to figure out if indeed TCO has been implemented or not. But either way, it escapes our control when we want to make sure that the, these functions have had the TCO applied to them or not. Okay. Let's now have a look at a language that found its place in the market and it is still quite modern and lots of people really like it. This is Haskell. Haskell is a functional programming language that is rely that relies a lot on immutability principles. And we can see that in functions like the ones we are looking at at the moment. On the left side, we see an implementation of the recursive uh, uh, algorithm used to implement the Fibonacci sequence and on the right of course the tail recursive implementation uh, in Haskell of the Fibonacci sequence. On the left we see again the same kind of overloading that we saw with Erlang and on the right the same thing as well. Uh, the difference is that this time we are testing both fun functions with the Fibonacci of 1000 and the idea is to let you see how the Fibonacci uh, implemented using Haskell has potentially a better performance than other languages because I was able to do this with a thousand uh, in in my local machine without any problem and without any any specific noticeable delay. Um, Haskell exists since 1987, at least 1987 was the first draft, the first release to the public was in 1990 and Haskell has been developed all throughout the years up until 2022. Let's have a look now at the practical example and see Haskell code in action. So Haskell projects are located in the root folder of my uh, project and we there, we there can find two different folders, one for factorial implementations and the other one for Fibonacci impl implementations. 
But before we get into the examples, let's have a look at how this was created. Uh, and especially how can we install Haskell. Haskell uh, needs to be installed using curl or wget. The idea is that we get this installation script out of their website. And uh, in this specific case, the compiler we are using is ghcup. And we are going to use it to execute these scripts. And, and, and with this compiler, we will be able to run our, uh, our different small programs. So let's have a look first at the recursive function. We can see via, via IntelliJ that uh, with the plugin, it recognizes very well all of the different uh, compositions of, the, of, the, of this Haskell code. And we see that we are calling the Fibonacci with 1000. Predictably, if we call this Fibonacci function uh, via the command line, of course, we first need to compile it and then we need to call it. This will not work. It will start my. Uh, it will trigger my computer to start making a, a huge amount of calculations, and we can already hear it again. And I will stop it because this is not what we want to do. We. I just wanted to show how slow this algorithm actually is. So let's try it with the the tail rack algorithm. So we can compile it this way, which GHC, and it will link the uh, the. Um, the executable file almost immediately and then finally we can just run this file right over here I'm sorry let me take this out of the way and if we run it we see that it calculates immediately the Fibonacci of 1000 and again the same applies here we don't know if tail recursivity has been applied or not uh, sorry we don't know if tail call optimization has been applied or not and uh, and we just know that this function has executed really fast for a high number. But one of the things that uh, this compiler allows us to do is to generate uh, profiling files. It generates a different kind of uh, intermediate language uh, elements so that we can see through the 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 code that is about to be compiled to assembly. For example, if I if I uh, let you see the Fibonacci tail recursive dot hi, we can see all of this. But that's not uh, if we have a look at the. Yes, I will first do one thing. I will compile this code in uh, you with the profiling tool included and I will run it and letting him dump the uh, profiling file that I need that, that I want to show so we have all of these files now and where is it there goes file it just recursive hi yes so Yes, so if we go to this file, it generates um, a report where we can see uh, how the different uh, aspects of the application are working. Uh, and this may help us uh, find out um, something about the application, but this report isn't really that much informative. If we, however, run the <clears throat> this command to dump the intermediate language components of our Haskell code we can then see that oh of course because I've changed the name of the file um, here there um, let me just change this for a moment. There. So, what this does, it shows us all the the uh, intermediate intermediate language that has been created in order to, as a pre-step to generate the assembly code. If I talk to you about intermediate language right now, by the way, 
And if you know something about Kotlin, you will probably be aware that there is a lot of conversations about intermediate language when it comes to the K2 compiler. So I don't want to, to do a segue right now to, uh, to Kotlin at the moment, but it is important to understand that at least from the time Haskell has arrived into the, the programming world, at least sometime after or even before, the idea of an interme intermediate language already existed. And this is to see here. To interpret this is something that is off the scope of this, uh, of this presentation, but I just wanted to show you uh, something that I find important for us to understand that, and we will see later on that there are trivial ways to find out if uh, tail call optimizations have been applied or not. But in Haskell, there is a possibility, a very real possibility to check if our code has been optimized or not. But Haskell is where, in our presentation, we end the, the, the timeline up until the 1990s. So now, let's go back to our slides. And something happens at the beginning of the 1990s, and that is the inception of the all-famous Java language. The Java language doesn't include tail call optimization, unfortunately or fortunately, let's have a look. Java was created in 1995 and Java deliberately does not support tail call optimization because allegedly of backward compatibility issues. It might not go well with the JVM architecture because of overhead and potential side effects. If we are going to implement a language that compiles, normally our concern, we can argue that the concern should be the, to compile the code and run the code as is in wherever we want to run it, in the case of Java, to run it in a Java virtual machine. Having said that, should we or should we not apply automatic optimizations to our code, which is the whole basis of tail call optimization? Apparently that hasn't convinced the uh, uh, Java team. There are concerns about performance and complexity because the code is no longer under our control as developers. The code is then under control of the compiler. Can the compiler automatically uh, um, automatically optimize the code or can the compiler automatically, by trying to optimize the code, make it actually worse? And in Java, especially because Java doesn't is not very strict, well, it wasn't very strict in terms of immut immutability, the iterative alternative was always possible. I think today that might have changed a bit, the whole idea of using uh, mutable variables to implement iterative algorithms is something that is not very, very positively seen by many developers. There could be different opinions, but it's still a conversation and it's not very clear if tail call optimization is the best idea for Java. There could be other things in the making and maybe a new releases, uh, in new releases of Java, we will find some kind of new innovation that we haven't even thought of yet. But of course, this is the thought behind Java and the Java virtual machine world. But this didn't stop the JVM alternatives to explore TCO possibilities. And it's very logic that it so is, because the alternatives wanted to explore exactly what Java didn't put on the table. Immutability, functional programming, and other new things that came along in the development of Java. So let's move on to the next language. So now let's have a look at a language that has been used for quite a few years and it had its peak of fame a couple of years ago. It's a language that is an alternative to uh, to Java and it also can generate bytecode to run in the Java virtual machine. This is of course Scala. Scala is a language that has been created as an alternative to Java as mentioned before and it has created in a way of being immutable and 
to use functional programming principles and not just object-oriented programming principles. Java was released in 2003 and it allows us to make this kind of code. This is an iterative code and this code is not typically what we would expect from a Scala implementation because it doesn't follow the principle of immutability. It is pretty much, uh, it makes usage of uh, different variables that change according to the runtime of the application. So this is a simple implementation of the iterative uh, algorithm. The other thing is we can also implement the recursive function of this. And finally, we can implement the tail recursive function with Scala with this. Scala uh, allows us to make these implementations and it also has tail recursivity and tail call optimizations possibilities. But it doesn't mean that the code that we have created here that is still recursive will be translated to an iterative solution. It means that the compiler is signaled to and triggered to see if we can perform a tail call optimization. Scala exists since 2003 and it has been developed all through the years up until 2020. Uh, but till Scala 3, which apparently was previously, previously known as Dotty, something I didn't knew about Scala. And now let's have a look at the practical example on how can we run Scala. But first, let's have a look at the makefile.mk where we find the install all script. With it, we can install Scala. It's just a question of using the SDK manager to install Scala for us. And, then, and when we install it, we are able to run it uh, via the command line and we can also install it in IntelliJ. Let's have a look at the code itself. In the code itself we can find a couple of functions that are that are really important to illustrate what's going to happen in terms of tail recursivity and tail call optimization. The first one is of course the iterative example where we always refer to. The second one is the Fibonacci recursive example which is the the non-efficient one which will not work. We also find the tail recursive example without any indication to the compiler that it is a tail recursive function. And we also have one example that will, uh, that is my attempt to create a, a function that would be, that would look like what we would get out of decompiling a code that has been compiled using t, uh, tail call optimization. And uh, we, also find here one function that is annotated with tail rack and we will see the difference if any and finally we have another function that seemingly could be a, a, a tail recursive function but it actually is not the only thing is that with scala we can prove all of these things so we can test this kind of different behaviors uh, in order to run scala i prefer to open this project the fibo fibonacci project in another window and this is because I want IntelliJ to recognize Scala to make life easier for us so that we can also see the other behaviors that uh, we want to investigate in this case. So <clears throat> let's uh, check out how to run the demo. The demo uh, is simply just a clean compile run of the code using SPT. So if we do that make run demo so in this case, we don't have the run fast and run slow. We run everything in one go. And if we need to run different kind of functions, we will just uh, comment things out and um, and, and remove comments. Uh, the, the idea is just to make it easy. The, uh, the, I find the easiest, the easiest way for a demonstration to do it this way. Um, and so let's continue with that. So the three fun functions that I just mentioned, the most important ones, I've already calculated the Fibonacci number of 100 and also the factorial of 100. And it is it has it ran really quickly in under a second. And so this is quite a fast execution. And let's see now what it actually does. So if we go to uh, our main function, we can see that we find here the Fibonacci iterative run. This is the first thing that, that it runs. And then the tail recursion uh, with T TCO, with the annotation. And then just the tail recursive function without the annotation. And then finally, the unmarked tail recursive annotation. 
which which contains this factor here. So let's see now what happens when we decompile this code using these functions. So if we go to target and go to Scala and then go here to classes, we can find Fibonacci here. And in this one, to this one, we can uh, apply this option, show decompiled class as Java. And here we have all the decompiled code. Okay. The code is decompiled and luckily is easy to understand. Usually decompiling code from the bytecode is can be troublesome, especially if we are decompiling things out of out of assembly, we get all of these variables without really uh, having a reference to what they meant in the actual original code. But here we do have all of those all of that information. So let's now have a look at the functions that we have uh, just analyzed for Fibonacci interactive and iterative when we go to the compile code let me just close these and we go right over here we see that the iterative uh, uh, m function didn't suffer a lot of changes in fact it's just purely iterative just as we had implemented it in Scala when we look at the next one which is the tail recursive which we, are, we already know that it will fail uh, the tail recursive is also implemented pretty much in the same way and if we look at it it's really just a one-liner with the whole implementation in it and so no tail uh, no optimization has happened here and we basically have the same code that uses too much resources for a very simple calculation then we find Fibonacci tail rec and this one is an important one to have uh, to pay good close attention to because this function uses a fib helper that is the helper function to be able to calculate easily the um, the Fibonacci uh, uh, algorithm so when we go to this function we see one thing and we see that the implementation is different and the implementation is different because this function is still recursive and as I mentioned before in the other algorithms, it's the compiler that usually decides, usually decides what is going to happen to the code that it is going to compile. Uh, Scala incorporates an automated way of doing this. The one thing that Scala also does is allow us via IntelliJ to detect which one of the functions are tail rack. And, and the reason IntelliJ does that for us is so that we know that a certain function may be optimized by this tail call optimization feature. So if we go back to the code, we can find other functions. For example, this manual implementation, we can have a look, but it won't change anything. Go to implement to the implementation and you find the helper function. It's simply just a for loop. And of course, that is exactly how it is implemented. In this case, with the while loop, it, the, the translation is the translation into code and the decompilation does what the compilation needs to do, but it doesn't really affect the way it runs. Uh, this one is annotated with annotation tail rec. And here is a good important distinction, as we find as you probably expect in the fib helper function, it is still a while loop. And it does exactly the same whether or where, whether it has a tail rec annotation or not. So the annotation dot tail rec annotation, it's simply a way to mark our code with functions that uh, potentially will be uh, optimized by the compiler. But we don't have to put them in, it's not mandatory. And finally, we have this one, which I found interesting also to do and to show in Scala that if we don't have a, a tail rec function, if it's not tail recursive, it will not work. And if we go here, nothing has changed in this function. And why is this function not a tail recursive function? Because it looks by all means uh, tail recursive. It's not tail recursive because we have a multiplication factor here that changes per call, so it needs to be stored in, per stack frame. And that goes against the whole idea of tail recursivity. 
All right, so just another test that we can make. We can try and run this code with this annotation to prove a small point here. If we compile this code now, it is going to fail and it's going to tell us very clearly why it failed. Let's just wait for a moment. There we go. So the it says cannot rewrite recursive call. It is not in tail position. That is true, but that's because of this n here. And if we look it and of course this code has not been compiled, so we cannot look at the decompiled code, of course, but it's just so that you have an idea that the annotation doesn't make a difference in the actual compiled code, or at least it doesn't seem to make any difference. It is there to remind us that this function uh, is till recursive. And not only that, it confirms that the function is tail recursive. If anything, we know that we've achieved tail recursivity and that maybe not in one version of Scala or in the other version of Scala, that optimizations can occur and perhaps in every version of Scala, depending on the algorithm that we are implementing, then that, that implementation can be better uh, in regards to tail call optimization. So this is the bit about Scala that I wanted to show. Uh, and let's move on to this bit. So now in, in, in this part of the presentation we can see exactly the difference between having a class annotated with uh, the tail rack, a, a class, a function annotated with, with a tail rack and a possible result that I manually created. So we've already been through this in the code and again we have here all the versions of Scala and it's important to focus our uh, attention to of course the annotation dot tail rack for the reasons we've seen before finally this is just a way for us to see the differences between the different kind of implementations so we've seen that the unmarked tail rack TCO doesn't get uh, um, doesn't get tail call optimized, and the the one that gets annotated with tail rack successfully will likely get optimized. And so we see here the difference very clearly. This one has not been optimized; it is still recursive in the bytecode. And this one has been optimized and it is no longer recursive in the bytecode. And the good thing about it is that we don't reserve uh, uh, <clears throat> we, we don't reserve stack frames for each call. It's just a while loop. No stack frames are, are, are being stored, so there's no risk of stack overflow. And the complexity remains the same as an it, as an, uh, it would be with uh, the original implementation, actually. Okay. So let's continue with our presentation. Now we're going to have a look at a language that had uh, quite a, a lot of success around 2007 and it was a language that was also providing an alternative to program uh, code that would be able to be compiled into bytecode and would be able to run in the Java virtual machine. This language was known as Clojure. And we're going to have a look at Clojure that started in 2007. Clojure offers us the possibility to implement code in a style that is very similar to Lisp or uh, Scheme. It has all of these parentheses, it has a different kind of construction, and this is attractive for people who really like to work with functional programming and immutability. It's also a language that provides a different way, a completely different way to program, and it's not really an, an, uh, an upgrade or a kind of dialect of another language. It's just something else completely new uh, that has its bases on the late 50s and the 70s, these languages that uh, um, that uh, sp span off of, uh, of Lisp. Um, so this is an, the iterative, uh, one of the possibilities to implement it iteratively. This one is a recursive implementation of the Fibonacci sequence. And this one is a tail recursive implementation of the Fibonacci sequence. That if we, if the compiler understands that it can be uh, optimized, it will apply tail call optimization and potentially will return it back to an iterative uh, uh, function in the compiled code, in the bytecode, in the Java virtual machine. 
Clojure exists since around 2007 and it went on to uh, release more versions up until 2022. Let's have a look now at one example of how Clojure works. So I've created an example that is located in Clojure projects in the root folder, of course, again, and we can see there a Fibonacci folder where we can uh, run our project. But before we do that, let's have a look at the make file and the makefile.mk where we have a script to install Liningen. And Liningen is a way that we have either to compile our uh, uh, Clojure code or to just run it, as, run it as a script. And what I like about it is that it makes it easier to create these small scripts that make us understand better what's going on behind the scenes. Clojure doesn't provide, unfortunately, uh, an easy way, at least I couldn't find it, of decompiling it and checking what we just did for Scala. But we can still uh, make code and draw conclusions out of what we are doing. So let's go to the source code, let's go here and then I can go through what we can find in this code, a uh, factorial uh, function, a Fibonacci iterative function. We also find a Fibonacci recursive function, a Fibonacci tail recursive function, and a Fibonacci tail recursive with, with a TCO. Um, and then we have these scripts that we are going to call from the command line. For the first one, we will calculate the factorial, the factorial using just one function. For the other one, we're going to use all the most efficient algorithms that we have implemented, the ones that run just like that. And we are also going to run another script where we are just going to see that everything will fail and nothing will get calculated because they are very slow algorithms. So let's have a look at the make file. In the make file, we can find three different scripts. One is a run demo fast, the other is a run demo slow, and the other one is just a run demo. Um, let's run the demo fast uh, script make run demo fast no make run run I apologize so make run demo fast and we can see that it calculates fairly quickly all of the algorithms that are intended to run in that script now let's run the slow algorithm and here everything happens just as in the other languages. The computer starts to run very, very slow and there is no way that we're going to let this continue to run up until the end. So I will stop it, control C, and this uh, ends up our uh, presentation about the about uh, closure. One thing that it's important to realize is that the tail recursive functions that we have here, the this one, for example, this one uses recur, this keyword, and the other one uses just a, a recursive function. Both of them could be optimized and could be subject to tail call optimization. However, the recur keyword is the one that tells the compiler, according to the documentation, that at least the documentation I could find, um, it tells the compiler that this function is still recursive. So I would expect that the compiler will only, lining in this case, will only uh, subject, subject this code to tail code optimization if the function is already marked to be tail recursive. If not, it I wouldn't expect him to, uh, to make a tail call optimization. So, Let's move on to the next language. Or not. I apologize again. <laughs> Let's have a look first at how exactly. So the, the, the idea here is to see exactly where the recur uh, keyword is being used. And here we can see that in the still recursive function, we are signaling the compiler that this function is recursive, it is tail recursive, and that potentially can be subject to a tail call optimization. Now, finally, we come to 2016, where literally a revolution is going on in the JVM world, and this came as a complete surprise to Java developers and other people working in Java, uh, in the Java virtual machine and with bytecode, the advent of Kotlin. 
Scotland came to the scene in 2016 from a team uh, in JetBrains and Kotlin offered something that was quite new in the in the programming language world, at least in my interpretation, and that is that it created a language that is easy to understand, easy to read, easy to use, that compiles a lot of the what they consider to be the best functionalities of all other languages. So Kotlin became something very, very um, uh, 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 easily assimilated by developers. And because developers mostly were enjoying uh, Java already, and they didn't like the big step to move to something like Scala or something like Clojure, Kotlin came to fit in a necessity that people were already apparently wanting for a long time. So let's see what happens with Kotlin. This is one example of an, an iterative function in Kotlin. We can see that if we compare this to the Scala version, not much really has changed. It's We still use the fun keyword um, and essentially not much really differs. If we think about the recursive function, it's also very easy to understand in this case. And if we go to the tail recursive function, we see this happening. However, there is something different in the tail recursion way that uh, in, in the way that Kotlin deals with tail recursion. And this really happens. This is something that uh, uh, in some algorithms really happens that the recursive functions get translated to a form of, um, of iterative solution, for example, with a for loop or with a while loop. But not always, of course, but we can see what happens. Now, Kotlin has existed since 2016 and has moved on to release a lot of versions up until 2023. And another thing that Kotlin offers is the tail rack keyword. The tail rack keyword allows us to signal to the compiler that this function is still recursive and that it can be subject to tail call optimization. But the difference is that the compiler will not do anything if we don't use the tail rack keyword, which is what we will see in the example that I'm going to show you right now. But for now, let's have a look at how this decompilation works. In Fibonacci tail recursive function, what we have here is a, a, a tail recursive call that will this is just a normal implementation of what we saw in the pseudocode, but look what happens when we decompile the bytecode that we have generated with the Kotlin compiler. We see that this we see that this has not generated a, a while loop as we probably would have expected because tail call optimization doesn't really happens automatically in Kotlin. And if we use the tail recursive keyword tail rec, then what happens is a complete transformation of the in initial function that we had implemented. So then we do find a while loop and we find a completely different algorithm that we probably don't expect or don't even think about. And this is one of the, of the differences between, this is the difference between working with tail rack and Kotlin and tail rack in other languages. But let's have a look now at the example. This example is not located in the root because I do a lot of projects in Kotlin. And so I've placed him right over, uh, right over here. So this is the Fibonacci uh, module, and here we can find the Kotlin code that I have created with different kinds of implementations. One of them is the iterative implementation that we have seen already. The other one is the recursive implementation. The other one, the tail recursive implementation using tail rack, and the same tail recursive implementation without using tail rack. Um, we can run this project just directly from IntelliJ because the fantastic compatibility that IntelliJ has with Kotlin. And if we run this, we will realize that all of these algorithms work well. And we see the result immediately right over here. 
The recursive function is separately implemented in a, in a different class, and if we run it, we'll see that things won't really work that well. And of course, because it's recursive, it will just blow up uh, into a massive use of resources, which is something that we do not want. So I can stop the process right over here. And another thing that we can easily do now that we have uh, Kotlin right over here, we can show the bytecode, we can decompile it. And right now, we can see the different kind of implementations that we have. Uh, looking at the iterative solution or the recursive solution probably doesn't doesn't make much sense but let's still have a look at at least the recursive uh, implementation if we look at this the recursive uh, uh, implementation gets translated to bytecode also in a recursive way so this tail recurs this recursive function will just not work uh, well in the in the in the JVM however if we run the tail recursive function with a tail call optimization with the keyword tail rack, we can see in the decompiled code that, <clears throat> that the implementation has turned into a, an iterative solution with uh, a while loop. So, and if we use just the iterative, uh, uh, just the recursive function without tail rack, we can see that the decompiled version tells us that the tail recursive solution has still been implemented in a recursive way. So no optimization has occurred here and we still run the risk of a stack overflow problem. So this concludes the presentation of the different languages from the end of the 50s up until 2016. So now we come to the point of the video that I tell my conclusions about this investigation. So my conclusions about this, uh, this investigation. First thing, which direction is this all taking? Well, we have been through a lot of languages throughout history and programming languages are looking at, are looking now as something that will continue to evolve forever and ever and ever. But they also shape the way we see uh, computers, the way we see programming, and also the way we look at science and also the way we look at what keeps us curious to many things that we are doing. So the direction is a strange one for me because one of the things that Kotlin did in that is very different than other languages is a power of influence. So the idea that we can follow a language so easily and essentially just push a few buttons and have amazing things happening for us. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? The direction that it it's it's taken in my experience doesn't make it clear about what does this all mean is programming still a challenge when we look at the different implementations that we have seen so far we have seen a decreasing level of complexity and at times an actually an increasing level of complexity one of the things that i see uh, happening a lot is that uh, trying to make everything immutable also forces us to to change the way we look at code. One of the examples with tail recursivity is that although it's very nice to just put a, a, a tail rack a keyword behind the function, uh, that also that is also something that stimulates the usage of immutability in our code. And although it's great to think about immutability, there is an unexpected or, or, or maybe an unintended consequences of, uh, of that. And that is that if we are going to implement tail recursive uh, 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 functions only, or if we are looking forward to build only tail recursive functions, what will also happen is that we will never think iteratively again. Uh, because we don't want to use loops, we don't want to use whiles anymore. And the funny thing, though, is that the 
most difficult challenges that I faced in in websites that are dedicated to teach us and show us how to make algorithms that are performant, not beautiful, but performant. They all teach us a very important thing. A performant algorithm doesn't necessarily has to have to be a beautiful one. A beautiful one. Uh, some of the most uh, efficient algorithms do use global vari variables. They do use uh, mutability. They do change the the uh, value of a certain variable. They don't make extensive uh, recursive calls, or if any at all, and they can use lots of loops within loops within loops. And so what is the challenge uh, today? Is it to make the code beautiful? Is it to make it performant? Is it both things? And are we thinking in with both things in mind? So the idea that uh, we are now forced, literally forced to think immutable and because of that also forced to not implement uh, anything else than recursive functions feels strange at least and I cannot say that it is an advantage or a disadvantage but the idea of letting the responsibility of the algorithm performance to the compiler feels like losing something so it is something to think about why do we do software development the focus seems to have been shifted from wanting to make code and enjoying code to um, to making things happen, to making things running. They are two different paradigms, but it still represents a bit of a shift. Are we being forced into thinking recursively? I've already sp spoken about that. Is mutability something to be completely removed from a programming language? This is a good question. And I think the answer is yes. I think as we look at uh, uh, mutable things that we use today, there is always an alternative to do that. And with things like uh, tail call optimization, we we have a, another place where we can always argue or start a discussion at work or with colleagues or with just as a hobby. Um, we could start the discussion why that would always start why did you use mutable variables here you can just use immutable immutability here and then implement an algorithm that if it was left behind like that it would be very inefficient but because of using just a small keyword tail rack it becomes very efficient giving that responsibility to the compiler productivity versus the joy of coding uh, one of the things that I see happening a lot with Kotlin today, and it was also one of the things with Java, by the way, is the idea of uh, being productive. But there's, I, I, I seem to feel, I, I feel a lot of less focus in the joy of coding, the joy of making code, just the pure joy of programming and seeing things work and thinking about the algorithms. It seems to be a different focus. What happens when we keep thinking only recursively when implementing algorithms? This is actually a good question. What happens there? Are we going to lose the ability to make algorithms that are iterative? Are we going to look in the future to iterative algorithms as something so complicated that we are only going to understand uh, recursivity? It's a weird thing because in, in the past, recursivity was something seen as more complicated than iterative. Uh, I wouldn't be able to answer this question. Can we blindly rely on TCO algorithms in the way that we already trust garbage collection? If we know enough about garbage collection already, we and we have worked enough with the JVM, with Java or any other language, we know that garbage collection is very handy, but because memory manage management was actually one of the reasons why Java uh, came to exist in the first place, and no one really likes doing that. And if I think about the time where I used to program a lot with C, uh, yeah, memory management was very confusing and I'm not sure if today if I would pick up C again if that would be uh, a good experience or not considering all of that uh, uh, code with pointers and with uh, with memory allocation, reserving memory it is very different to work with that but if we think about the TCO algorithms I'm not sure if we're not bumping into something like that in the future again where things are going to be difficult just because we don't use them anymore, just because we let the compiler do all of that for us. 
So we'll see. Can we manually implement a better algorithm with better performance than TCO? This is likely true. We can. Uh, we can always implement better algorithms. We can always find something better. Um, the good thing about not having to rely on uh, tail call optimizations is that we are free to test our algorithms and we have the freedom to implement a better algorithm. And for those algorithms, we can predict what's in there. We can see through the, through the Java docs and through decompilation what's in there. And so if we can implement a better algorithm, I guess so. Would we still be able to do it if we don't practice? Again, this is the this is the point, the whole point of this presentation. Can we do great algorithms in the future if we start to become accustomed to not doing a certain kind of algorithms? Because that's what we're talking about. Not using mutable val not using mutable vari variables. If we don't use them, then we are we are closing the door to a lot of algorithms. Can we go back to them in the future? Interesting question. And can we still produce without challenges in the long run? So this question comes because in the long run, if we use all of these tools, the question is, can we still face difficult challenges in the future if, if we are not challenge ourselves to do difficult things. So the idea of not having challenges and being able to grow might be a, a paradox in itself because we do need challenges to grow. So before I start with this segment, what I want to say is I do enjoy the Kotlin programming language. I think it's an amazing language and I think it's very well written. The my only issue with Kotlin, and I guess I can call it an issue, is that it is a language that crossed a barrier, or it it sits in the limelight of something that it's not very easy to determine if it's a good thing in the long run or, or not. In my personal experience with uh, with Kotlin, I can say that um, we don't need to know that much to achieve great things with this language. And that's where maybe a problem could arise from. But I don't know, I'm not a scientist. I'm just, I'm just, uh, I have, I may have a scientific mind, but I'm not a scientist myself. And this is just to reflect on that a bit. If you have any questions, please leave comments in the comment section of this video. Uh, make sure to give your opinion about the video. I would love to hear it from you. Uh, if you want to ask questions about a particular language or things that you might have seen in this video that you may think that should have been said or written in a different way or whatever, please comment in the video. Again, this video is made out of my personal experience and also about, it was, it's also a compilation of different sources that I have checked on the, uh, around the internet from uh, reliable sources. And if you are interested in knowing more about, you can go to the sources that I have placed right over here. These are the image sources, which of course, all of them have their own specific um, uh, Creative Commons licenses. And finally, these are the dots of sources that I've used to check the things that I've, uh, that I found out uh, to make this, uh, this video. Thank you for watching this video and if you enjoyed this video don't forget to leave a like subscribe read the description for further details which is very important uh, again leave a comment um, if you dislike this video leave a dislike if you want to learn more about Kotlin don't forget to check out the playlist that I've made about it it is a comprehensive list of all the videos that have been made for this channel. Have a look at it. See what you think. Of, uh, tell me what you think about it. Uh, the community tab is available for you, and uh, it, it is something that I do for you, the viewer that watches these videos. And um, 
yeah. And until the next video, have a good one. As a short disclaimer, I'd like to mention that I'm not associated or affiliated with any of the brands eventually shown, displayed, or mentioned in this video.